So don't write exception classes to clear exception types um, because I have heard that such detail work great. Um, some notes up front. I have, of course, some code to show. It's Slideware, but it compiles. Um, I might have some personal opinions. You might share them or not. And I will not present a universal solution for exception handling, of course. Right? I have also a very high motivated number of slides. Before the break, if I'm too fast, please uh, just stop me. A um, bit of history. Once I have dropped into a project, and it was very object-oriented, with the rules that one class has one header and one implementation files, and there have been a lot of entities, and there was always a single entity and a group of entities, and so it was two classes, and each of these had one exception. So it has been very many exception classes. And I looked at this and I said, no, I don't actually don't like this. I can replace this, all these exceptions with one-liners. And after a while I did, and I replaced also other stuff with one-liners, with the result that the management was not so happy because the lines of code productivity per sprint decreased. <laughs> so I moved on to another project. <laughs> but since then, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking always a little bit about the exceptions or error handling in general. And let's have a look how exceptions look like very often. They may look like this. Yes, so derivate from std exception. If you just want to include exception and implement your message, what you want to, to bring, and the message string. Or if you don't want to have some message, if you just want to report what's going on, you might do it like this. If you want to include std accept and derivate from runtime error, then it becomes even shorter by using the constructors. This is basically the same as the very first slide. It takes a string and, and has a message. And this is the, the one-liner. We actually say, OK, I have a tagged error. What is it? I give it some class. It doesn't need if to exist this class. And the implementation of this looks like this. So it's a tagged error. It derivates from random error. And with the class, it will become a unique type. And so you can create a lot of different types based on runtime error, if you want. And uh, you can declare them with one-liners. And then you can declare as many errors as you want. <coughs> and the constructor works. And I would be basically nearly done. But let's look at something different. Numbers as types. We have the possibility to take values as template arguments in C++ and create types out of values, integer values. So I can create the number one and the number two type, which represent the value one or two. They will be real types, so I can overload functions on them, do whatever I want. And when you think about this, I go a little bit further, I could add some type category because integer is a bit, little bit very generic. So I define here an arrow type. I say, OK, it takes a type tag. And then I define an error, which derivates from this. And it takes the type and the type value. So this already cries, hey, there comes an enum or a num class. And indeed, this is the case. You can declare an enum. And then you can define using your error, taking the num and the enum value. With a little bit syntax sugar, it becomes even shorter. We can declare a POSIX error. And then it's even shorter to create a type. And then you have numbers of as types that you can throw around, even exceptions if you want, or return from functions. They share a common base class. And they are compile time constants. So you can use them during compilation time, which is very nice. So numbers of types are sometimes useful, not just for exception handling 
hardware addresses, whatever. So not just for errors. And you don't need to go home and write uh, enum classes. There is a system error header, which has actually this enum defines. And it defines also other stuff. Uh, we maybe come a little bit to this. So use this if you want to use system error codes in your type. So let's look at something different. Very often when uh, exception is coming, right, I want just to see something like this in a log. What happened? It is basically the error type. Define the line and the function, because when I see this when I'm developing, especially during the testing phase, I actually know exactly where to go, what happens. And I want to have this very easy available. So C++20 will bring us a, a Swiss location that is const expression. So with C++20 we can have the file name, the line, and the function name. I had to compile them also. So I could make something like this, a typed location, where I say, okay, I create a type out of a location. You might notice that this is fantasy code. Right, you see it? But let's say this exists. Then I could make my bad value exception typed location and just throw in some struct that doesn't need to exist. And this bad value should actually come here as a string in my fantasy world, in the nice world. Hmm? So declaring types, throwing them with the current location. And this could bring the last line. There are of course some, some problems. The source location is not here yet, but you can fake it very easy. And compile time type name does not exist at all, and also not in 20, maybe 23, we will see. Will it get the, the line number at the point of use or the point mm -hmm. of declaration? The point where you write it. So if we go with, uh, at mm, here, current location. So the point of, of so what does it give the line number where it's used? It gives the line number where this line of code is in the file, mm -hmm. the file name. So and, and of course, getting a type name would be useful not just for exception, it would also be useful for serialization. I'd give me a struct and I'd give it a name and dump it to some, some stream. It would be super handy to have it. So let's, let's make something. So for source location, it, you might, it might already exist in your compiler and experimental. If not, it's super in, simple to implement. This is, of course, in, in your code, it would look nicer. This has to fit on the slide. Const expression class takes strings. They have static storage location, so they exist at compile time. Of course, macros are still a thing, so the current location. Wherever I, I, I write this, the file name and the line number at this text will be there. Um, here is a compile time function. This is the only implementation I, I show today. But this is basically a text two strings, zero terminated, checks if they are equal, and it can do this at compile time. So I can create my current location as a const expression. I can start the assert on the line, and I can even start the assert with this equal function on the main. S functions like equal function, will, they will be nicer when we have the full uh, algorithm const expression. I don't know when this will come. I think it should already be here. But here we have a little bit of compiled and programming. Hmm? So compiled and type name. What do you think does this print? It's a theoretical question, but may, you may have seen it, right? So if I print this out, this function, I get actually this one, right? And we have here the type name. And we have the type name here. And it's there since ever. And I'm so annoyed that we cannot have it in our programs. This is really not nice. And this is, it is, of course, like its uh, compiler implementation defined, how this source location, right? How they make it, function name. This is also very annoying. But it's here since ever. 
and we cannot have it. And if you want to watch a video when you come home, I can recommend this one, your knife. Damn, well, why can we not have these nice things, right? But let's get the type name. So it starts as a const expression function because I want to have all this stuff at compile time. And then it's like if Microsoft compiler or the rest of the world, right? And what this is doing, it takes the, the function, print the function name or the function stick from the macro. It is func uh, functions like I showed you first. It's just searching something in the string at compile time, finding positions. The relevant part is get a start position and get an end position in both of this. When I have start and end, I know the length at compile time of a string. And I can create a carrier, which is basically just the array. A carrier is, again, a number as a type. But it uses the number to define an array at compile time. And then I can fill this as compile time. And I can put every string things I want in there. So if the file name of the current location is so long, I can shrink it to this and make one compile time string for the whole message, if I want. But with this, I can, I can extract actually the, the type name with an uh, ugly hack. And then I can bring it together. The implementation is not very interesting. I take the source location as a base class. I have the, the error. And in the construct, I take, I take a pointer to the error. It's, of course, constant expression. The type location can derivate from us. I can here get the type name. I don't know the type at compile time, so therefore the tackle type, because I don't know the size, what comes in. And the constructor that just passes then the, for the first character. And then I can implement the stream operator to have nice log messages. And the whole thing works as compile time. So I can use this as at compile time. And of course, I can throw it, and I can catch it as a base class, if I want. Hmm? So a short summary of this part. Source location soon in the standard, or you have it already. Unfortunately, implementation defined. Type name via macro is, of course, I can't take this very serious, but the other people have also usage for this. There is, for example, this nice GitHub project, debug macro, where you put the debug, whatever. It can be a, array, a vector of integer, and it will write a type, vector of integer, bracket one, two, three. If you, so, and the debug, it produce wonderful debug output. And what it does, it takes the same trick to get the type name. There is even a library solution, name of, which does much more. It tries to mimic reflections. So obviously, people have a huge need for this. And we can hope for 23 that this comes. And I'm not happy about this, because if you see this color of this beard, when I heard the first time about concept, it didn't have this color. So and this is maybe funny, but not really. So yeah, mm, something different. What about the catch part? But I didn't introduce too many common base classes. So, because in my opinion, this is not super optimal to use because it's not const expression. I cannot use it at compile time. It gives me nothing for the message, really. I have to override something I don't want to override. As I've shown, it, it works also without. I would need to, to make some things. And there is also in the, in the C++ core guideline, the recommendation, don't derivate from the existing types. Make your own in your application, maybe in your own namespace. And I, I share this opinion. So now I make an assumption. The best way for exception is to create a log entry and then quit. For me, exception is nothing where I can recover. When I recover, I want maybe some return value. But how can I encapsulate this if I have no common base class? So I have here some, some random structs. They have no common base class. If I have code that throws something, I can have one log function that takes current exception. So we can query at runtime which exceptions are flying around, which is interesting. And then I can exit. So you can make this code as a keyboard macro and put it around everything if you want. 
and how does log look like? It takes an exception pointer, which is a pointer to something that has been flying around. And you get we are current exceptions. We don't know it. We have to check that this is something because it's a pointer. It could be null. Then we re-throw the problem. And then we can do our pattern matching for poor people, catching by type. But in this way, if you have no common base class in something, for exceptions, you can put this on lo your location for, for, for logging, for example, or for other stuff. So sometimes, oh, it should be S to the exception. It's not the best base class. Current exceptions to, to get what is currently thrown, if you need to know this. An exception pointer you can use to re-throw and get types. And my wish for the future is, of course, pattern matching, because I don't like this overload of the function, so the catch is just the overload. And, and the try shouldn't create a new scope, necessarily. I have something different. Well, so what will this print? Right, we have this. It, will it be foo? Will it be main foo? Will it be main brackets foo? Something different. You don't need to answer. I had three different results with three different compilers. So it's obviously not good. And it's obviously also not, not needed. So I hope really static reflections will ever come. And at this point of the pr presentation, originally I wanted to complain about other things we don't have, right? But because actually this bad value, putting it as a struct in, I should be able to put it just as a, as a struct in, right? Uh, as a text in. And we, 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 there's no way to do this today. We can do something like this. And under the hood, it will be initialize a list. So what is the, 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 the solution today for this? It's of course macros, right? So you be, we put the macro in front of this. This will translate the, the, the text into something like this. Then this works great. I could now make an implementation based on this. It's the same like we've seen before, just a little bit different, to work with these types. The macro is, of course, a disaster. Right? You can define up to how many characters do I want to go. And then it creates this long comma separated string, and we will put zeros at the very end where the string ends. It's not good. There is even a library, library, macro library solution for this, which I cannot even put on a slide. But obviously, people need this, right? So I'm not the only one who would like to have this. And the people put, I, I didn't also invent this one, by the way, right? So people put a lot of effort in this to have this. And then we can do this, right? A set value, a bad value, and I can create a type of a string, which is nice for the message if I don't want to have dynamic data. And this is, of course, compile time available. And they have also really the same type, as you see. So this is cool. And we have also things like this where we have a, can define an integer sequence, and then we can take a, a template for a string literal. And with this, we could create the type location. It's just another variation of this. It takes a bunch of characters. As you see here, I need to put here the, the type, which we had here, which is returned from this function. When I want to use it, tackle type, I didn't make the work to, to put the macro around this to, to, to but then we can use this as type. Works also as compile time. It is, of course, this is not the prettiest thing, and it is, anyway, a GNU compiler extension, so it's just a in one compiler. But and here is the great news, C++20 will fix this, and I'm super happy about this. So it's not just that we can take integral types as, as, and, and create as template argument and create types of them. We can take everything so every user-defined type that can be compared and has no private members. So it works also for char arrays, because the compiler can obviously compare char arrays at compile time. And when we create a wrapper like this, which is like the carrier we have seen before, right? It takes just uh, size t for how big is the data. Then in the constructor, it takes whatever string is there at compile time. 
And here we have, I call it a type function. It's actually a helper for the compiler to construct these things. It's one of the things it's read by the compiler like this. But I call it type function because it helps me to give me the type. And then I can do pretty things like this. So there is no macro magic anymore with C++20. This will be great. We can create real types out of strings. And they work also at compile time. Which is nice. Hmm? I like it. So, the overall summary for this short talk. When you're in a project that has a lot of pain, it leads to some interesting thoughts. Some can be more useful than others. In this case, it was a little bit generic programming, compiler programming, new upcoming missing features, and some nice code games. Or some are not too nice. Right. Exception is a complex topic overall, so I've promised there will be no solution in this talk because there is none. Today we live in a world with three different exception handling strategies. The one is of course throwing exceptions around, which some people don't absolutely not like or cannot use. The other thing is error codes, what's new in uh, system error, which is will hopefully be fixed. And then we have other upcoming like STD expected, which might already be an experimental or boost outcome, which is also heavily discussed, where we say, and this is what other programming languages also do, when you say, give me something, you get a, either the result or you get a error code back. And when you access the result, it will terminate the program <coughs> or whatever you do. And usually you can, you, in, other, in modern programming language, you can pattern match on the result without new scope and so on. And there is hope for us. Uh, zero over deterministic exceptions, perhaps Sutter. This is a very long paper, and it's not the only paper to this topic. Where we actually goes into what is today's situation, what would we like to have in the future? That also embedded developer can use the same error strategy like desktop developer or so on. That this overhead disappears. Then there are a lot of other papers. Freestanding needs some way to, to mix this. Because today we're living in a world where if you look at boost file system, it has two interfaces, right? One function for each that throws and one function that returns an error code. And I mean, this is not, you don't want to write libraries like this. So let's hope that this will bring us a better future. I um, have high hopes, but low expectations because this will not be very fast here. <laughs> so, but uh, at least there is something to hope. And this was, my talk and thanks for listening. It was 104 slides. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> and if you have any questions, I can answer a few. So what's the performance characteristics of having a lot of catch clauses in a row compared to having only one? I don't think very much because it's a switch of the compiler, basically. It's like having function overloading. Would be interesting to measure someone, but I don't think that it makes, but it is the, the same mechanism that the compiler will, it's like overloading a function, type selection at, at runtime. I thought it had to like tr dynamically try them one at, yeah, one at a time. It's a dynamic cast for Yeah, it is, it is this exception that came with their own version of runtime type information, right? Mm -hmm. So you need to apply this. And, but when you throw, you don't care about this anyway anymore, right? If you want to have a fast exit, then you have exit, yeah. <laughs> not exception. So, hmm? any other questions? Mm, no. Then we can have we have already food in the other room, outside, and then we will see here again in approximately one hour. So enjoy the break. Thanks. <laughs>